Thank you, Dr. Christick. So I'm going to talk on healthy aging and senior living. Yeah, there you go, perfect. First of all, I want to once again thank our supporters, uh, Belmont Village Senior Living, Continuing Life, Elder Health, Gary and Mary West Foundation, Monarch Cottage, the Paradise Village, the San Diego Foundation, and we at La Jolla Village. I also want to thank uh, the UC San Diego supporters, without whom this center would never uh, have functioned or thrived. Uh, School of Medicine, Qualcomm Institute, the Stein Institute for Research on Aging, Institute of Engineering and Medicine, the Cowley Institute of Mind and Brain, the CAC School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, the Office of Research Affairs, and Osher Lifelong Learning. So once again, I want us to give a big hand to all the supporters. I'm going to start with what is healthy aging and why should we care about it? Then I'll describe what we have been doing in the Center for Healthy Aging. And finally, I want to spend some time thinking about reimagining tomorrow's senior living. So why is uh, healthy aging important? For people who have reached the age of 65, today they will have an average 20 more years of lifespan and that will increase to 30 years just in a few decades. So imagine, you know, 65 was usually is considered the age of retirement. After that, people are not much of use to the society. That's how they are looked at. And there are 30 years in which they can accomplish a lot and contribute to the society. And we need a new approach to senior health care. The current system for senior health care is really broken. And it will get worse progressively unless we change it radically. The thing that will be needed, uh, one of the problems is that the supply of geriatric health care specialists is actually declining even as the demand continues growing. It is actually societal embarrassment that we have fewer people going into geriatrics and geriatric specialties today than was the case 10 years ago. And that's because of poor reimbursement of the geriatric health care. On the other hand, the aging baby boomers want an active and engaged life rather than a retired and retiring life. For that reason, healthy lifestyle and preventive health care are going to be critical. And where can you practice healthy lifestyle and preventive health care? Not so much in the hospitals and clinic. It will be in the homes and communities. So the homes and communities will become the primary sites of health care. And that's why this symposium is important in terms of thinking about senior housing. So what does chronological age mean? So it is the number of years after birth, right? And we ask each other how old you are, and then we get that answer. And that's a very reliable answer, right? So if I ask you to think about a 90-year-old woman or 90-year-old person, you would think about someone like this, a frail, um, disabled lady who is being cared for by someone younger, right? That's the usual notion about a 90-year-old. What if I told you that this lady is also 90 years old? <laughs> this is an Australian woman who set up a world record for long term in her age group at the age of 90. So when you say 90, why should you only think about a frail and disabled person? You should also think about what is possible and the second lady illustrates what is possible. Even another example, Ida Keeling. There's a story in New York Times about a year ago. This is a New Yorker. She's set a world record for centenarian in 100 meter dash. What is interesting is that she entered her first road race at the age of 67. As she was getting older in her 60s, uh, she stopped working outside because she had to retire and she was feeling lonely and depressed and her daughter said that let us do something active. And so then she entered this road racing and at 100 she completed uh, this, uh, she got this world record. 
Is this an example of healthy aging? Of course it is an example of healthy aging, right? However, that raises a question that does healthy aging include being in a wheelchair for most of one's adult life? Most of us will say what a silly question. Of course not. If somebody is in a wheelchair, that means that person is disabled. That is not healthy aging, right? Well, if that is the case, then what about this gentleman? Some of you may recognize him. He is FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was the president of the US during the Second World War. He developed polio in his early 30s. And that was followed by a syndrome called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which left him paralyzed in both his legs. So from that point onward, the rest of his life, he was in a wheelchair. So can you imagine a president of a country during such a turbulent period as Second World War being a wheelchair-bound person? And yet, he, no word we will question that he was one of the most successful presidents in the history of the country, if not the world, right? So being in a wheelchair, being disabled didn't prevent him from having a very healthy, successful life and major contributions to the society. So that's something we have been interested in looking at, that what is physical aging versus functioning in other ways. So for the last several years, we have been doing a study called SAGE, Successful Aging Evaluation Study. Aging is, most people think about aging as physical aging. Sometimes people also think about cognitive aging in terms of Alzheimer's disease, dementia. But there is another very important component that is psychosocial aging. So that includes emotions, well-being, happiness, socialization. These things are not included in physical or cognitive aging. That's a separate part and that got to be studied. So we have been doing a study of uh, over 2,000 home phone users, somewhat randomly selected uh, in San Diego, ages 21 to 100. We start with a phone interview, then we have a mail-in survey that they complete at home. It takes about an hour, hour and a half to complete. And we also collect their saliva sample, and we are right now doing some genomic analysis of the saliva. This study differs from most other studies of aging in that the focus is not just on physical aging and cognitive function, but we also look at positive traits like resilience, optimism, compassion, wisdom. And I'm going to show you just one slide from this data. So we use a scale that measures both physical health and mental well-being as overall composite measures. So this is the physical health from age 20 to 100, right? So what you see is in the 20s, 30s, uh, physical health is very good, slowly starts declining, and by the time you are 90, most people are disabled. So that's the usual notion about aging. And so if you divide that into first half of life and second half of life, the first half is fine physically, fountain of youth, right? And the second half of life is all decline. What happens to mental well-being? It goes exactly in the opposite direction. Uh, as people get older, they feel happier, more contented, more satisfied. So, and this is not true only in the general population. It is also true in people with serious illnesses, serious physical illnesses like cancer, HIV AIDS, serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia. We find that, and we have studied hundreds of people with uh, these conditions, we find that well-being increases with aging even in people with serious illnesses. And that well-being is correlated with levels of resilience, optimism, and other positive traits, but not with severity of illness. You may have a person in the stage four of cancer, and that person may be happier than somebody who is just diagnosed with cancer. And this is important. Numerous studies have shown that resilience, optimism, and social engagement are associated with longer and healthier life. Literally hundreds of studies. So there are solid empirical data showing that resilience, optimism, social engagement, these are not just feel-good science, but they contribute to improved biology in terms of physical health and longevity. We all have seen this um, depiction of physical aging, right? So children and then adolescents and then young adults 
and in old age is all downhill, you get disabled and so on. But so that is physical aging. So look at the first half and second half of life. What about the psychosocial aging, first versus second half of life? So childhood is not always fun, right? I mean, it's a period of emotional t turbulence and emotional breakdown and temper tantrums, and then you reach adolescence, <laughs> which is a very difficult period uh, for adolescents and others. Um, and then comes the <coughs> 20s and 30s and early 40s. It's a very stressful period. You are taking care of kids and you, are, you have a lot of work to do at home and you also have an outside job. How do you handle all those? So the first half of life, the so-called fountain of youth, is actually a fountain of stress, anxiety and tension. What about the second half? When you reach the 50s, then people start thinking about themselves and say, well, let us do something about it ourselves. The kids are moved out of the house and then you start doing physical exercise to keep yourself healthy and you learn how to relax. You start your some creative activities like art. And so look at the first half and second half and you will agree, you know, who wants to go to the first half, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that fountain of youth is not exactly what it is supposed to be. So is there something called wisdom of aging? Um, this is uh, Dr. Eric Kandel, a Nobel laureate. Um, he is a neuroscientist at Columbia. He is a former colleague of uh, Dr. Brenner. He said that, I think I do science better now than I did when I was younger. And uh, he's now in his 80s. Uh, I now have a better understanding of which problems are important and which are not. And that's not true only for science. All of us, whether we are teaching, doing research, uh, doing some other administration or any job, we get better at whatever we are doing, we learn to prioritize things better than when we were teenagers or in our 20s. So is there anything that actually gets better with aging? And this is one of the areas of focus for our center. Again, there is considerable empirical literature, some of those studies done by us, some many by others, that show that several things improve with aging. Well-being, satisfaction with life that I already showed you, positivity. As we get older, we favor positive emotions and memory more than the negative ones. Decisions that require experience. Control of emotions. Think about a teenager, right, where the emotions fluctuate from hour to hour, minute to minute, and older person is usually exactly at the other end. Compassion, empathy, altruism, doing things for others rather than selfishly for oneself. And self-knowledge or insight. So there are things that actually get better with aging. In addition, there is something called grandma hypothesis of wisdom. Research has shown that when grandparents are involved in raising grandchildren, those children live longer, they are happier, and they produce more children than the grandparents did. And this is again not just feel-good science. This has been shown in bottlenose dolphins, killer whales, some birds, and humans. And these are papers published in journals like Nature. Uh, so pretty hard science. Uh, and some of my colleagues here at UCSD reported a couple of years ago that there may be something called grandparent genes. Some variants of genes, CD33 and APOE, which result in better immune functioning and also suppressing the amyloid in heart and brain. So the idea is that if you have those um, uh, genes, you are not only likely to live longer and healthier with better brains, but also you would be involved in raising the grandchildren, which is useful for the species. So there are things that get better and that is actually useful from even from an evolutionary perspective. But the one question is, how can anything improve with aging is in the brain? When I went to medical school, I was taught that the only thing that happens to brain with age is that it shrinks. Well, we now know, considerable research in the last 15 to 20 years uh, clearly has shown that there is something called neuroplasticity of aging. The brain continues to evolve and grow in later life if, and that's an important if, if stimulated by physical, cognitive, and psychosocial activity. And this has been shown in animals from mice and rats to cats and dogs to humans. And so what happens is there is a loss of neurons and synapses in old age. However, that is compensated for by increasing the activity of the remaining neuron 
and even forming new neurons and new synapses, something that would have been thought heretic a uh, couple of decades ago. So based on that, we and others have proposed some strategies for healthy aging, diet, calorie restriction, the so-called superfoods rich in antioxidants, uh, physical cognitive activity, social engagement and support, stress reduction through meditation or other means, resilience, optimism, sleep hygiene, and appropriate health care, both therapeutic and preventive. So this is all fine and we know these strategies. And as Dr. Brenner said, we have been doing that research at the Stein Institute for a number of years. But increasingly, we came to realize that we need to go beyond this. We need to go beyond medicine. So just a word about Stein Institute. Uh, this was the first institute on aging established in the entire University of California system back in 1983. So UCSD really has been a pioneer in aging um, for a long time. Uh, today we have 140 faculty members and it has a three-pronged mission, research, research training and community outreach. The research uh, focused successful aging. Uh, uh, we are proud of the training. We start at high school level to get them interested in aging and then undergraduate, graduate, medical students, pharmacy students and community outreach. We have monthly public lectures that are broadcast on UCTV and YouTube. We publish a monthly newsletter called Successful Aging. Um, it is free. If you want a copy of that, just log on to the website aging.ucsd.edu and we'll start sending it to you monthly uh, free online. So we realized that we need to go beyond medicine and it's, what is critical is really we need to break the silos. Aging is not a purview of any single field. And it is important to sort of broaden the focus to physical, cognitive, psychosocial health, healthcare, and lifestyle. So our vision is Tomorrowland in which there will be lots of healthy, happy, and wise seniors, and importantly, no stigma about aging. That's one of the critical problems in aging is the stigma against aging. And for that reason, we have been collaborating across the campus and with the local community, foundations, housing industry, technology industry, and local government, the area agency on aging. And also we have an international think tank that includes experts from across the globe. And uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Christick and Dr. Brown's um, Office of Research Affairs uh, recognize us as one of the frontiers of innovation center. Hmm? Okay. So the center now includes schools of medicine, engineering, management, and pharmacy, all the four schools at UCSD, as well as general campus, undergraduate and graduate. Uh, the technology industry, senior housing industry, all of them together, along with the community. And I call this humble bragging. <laughs> but in the last two years, we have, and this, by we, I mean lots of people involved in the center. Um, obtained more than $2 million of federal funding from NIH, VA, Department of Defense, um, another 325,000 from foundations and others, and another 300,000 from other programs at uh, UC San Diego. And as Dr. Christick mentioned, uh, the pending grant, so this will be announced hopefully soon with uh, $10 million um, partnership with IBM. That involves uh, not just Center of Healthy Aging, but also cognitive sciences, social sciences, and engineering. Uh, as well as microbiome. But, um, in return, we have supported a number of innovative cross-campus uh, research and education projects. We raised $350,000 from UCSD partners. Um, and again, I want to mention specifically schools of medicine, pharmacy, as well as um, the various centers, including the Cowley Center, Cent uh, Institute for um, Engineering and Medicine, the Qualcomm Institute, and uh, Stein Institute for Research on Aging. And we have used this money to support 12 cross-campus proposals on healthy aging. We got numerous submissions, and it was hard, um, it was not an easy thing to do, but we selected 10 research projects and two educational projects, which have been very successful in the time. And uh, again, our, our work has been covered in from New York Times to Atlantic, uh, TED talk and so on. Okay. I just want to give examples of a couple of um, studies that we have been doing. One study 
Um, this is a study funded by the San Diego Foundation. Um, it was a randomized controlled trial on engaging seniors in advocacy. So eight week program. So the idea is that you know we want older people to walk around, but where will they walk if there is a big pothole on the outside road? It is hard. Uh, sometimes the pedestrian crossing, the light stays green for 10 seconds, and even for a healthy person, you have to run. To how do? You, so how do you make that possible? So what we did was we had the students, undergraduate students from UCSD, go to some of the senior living places, and establish teams, uh, and the students they train the older people in terms of identifying the problems and then deciding how do we advocate for fixing those. For example, um, writing to the city engineers or calling the supervisor. And in the beginning, the older people are somewhat reluctant, how do we do that, but slowly and surely they got into it. And number of those problems were fixed actually within weeks. Uh, as I said, this was a randomized control trial. The control group had physical activity but no advocacy. And we found there was a significant increase in the seniors' advocacy skills. Also importantly, significant improvement in the students' attitude toward aging and older adults. Again, we, if we are going to reduce ageism, we got to work with younger people and help them connect with older people who are functioning at a high level. Uh, all the participants were satisfied with the program. And last but not least, the, the PR of this project was a graduate student. She completed her PhD, and that was her PhD dissertation. So really an example of how you can do research uh, with the funding from San Diego Foundation and others that will result in, th that's a win-win-win situation, right? Another new collaboration we are just starting uh, with the Mather Institute, LifeWays Institute on Aging, uh, based in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Uh, so this is going to be a randomized controlled trial using innovative step-to-wage adaptive trials design. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. It's a four-week group intervention, total of 90 people in senior living facilities in San Diego, Chicago, and Tucson. And the important thing also is we will train the local staff in the senior living to administer the intervention. I don't think in future we can have MDs and PhDs administering the intervention. There are just not enough of us to do that. So we have to have the local staff as the therapist. Uh, and the outcome measures will include resilience, physical and mental well-being, uh, attitude toward aging. And then we will follow these people three months later to see how much of the improvement has persisted. Um, example of an educational program. Uh, we have a program called Design Competition that is uh, also supported by School of Engineering, Qualcomm Institute, and the Design Lab, where engineering students work with older people in senior living to develop technology that meets seniors' needs. It's really one of the most exciting things I've seen. Uh, they have developed things like, um, how do you improve lighting at night when person gets up? It's all dark. You don't want to switch on the light because uh, you will wake up. And so they develop something, students, with the help of seniors, where as soon as you step on the carpet, that part of the carpet lights up. Second step that lights up. And really very innovative, brilliant um, um, technology is developed by the students in collaboration with the seniors. Um, a new course on aging for undergraduates in arts and humanities, working with residents of senior living, and developing a sensitivity training program for direct care workers in senior living. And then going beyond housing is uh, making San Diego age friendly. Um, so we are working with the county's um, aging and independent services. Uh, the San Diego Foundation has been a major supporter of this uh, important initiative. And also we are working with other cities that are participating in um, age friendly community movement. The focus is on healthcare, lifestyle, technology, intergenerational volunteering activities, education and training. And uh, we published a paper on age-friendly communities, public health approaches to promoting successful aging. And this includes people from at least six different age-friendly community movements. Uh, so really we are proud that San Diego is taking leadership role in this moment. 
and last but not least is uh, our project in um, Italy. Um, this project started because of Dr. Brenner's um, relationship with the University of Rome and this is an exciting study of 300 centenarians in the rural Cilento region. Um, the mayor of one of those villages actually said that 10% of the people in his village are 90 or over. So we want to find out what is the secret of their longevity. Um, it may be their lifestyle, which um, includes social engagement, um, diet, which includes rosemary, olive oil, um, and positive traits. We are also looking at their levels of resilience, optimism, and so on. And the UCSD brings research on cutting edge biomarkers, including microbiome in this population. So finally, how do we use this knowledge to reimagine tomorrow's senior living? So as I said earlier, the primary sites of healthcare are shifting from hospitals and clinics to homes and communities. So I think senior housing is much more than a shelter or financial investment. It is a home for health healthcare, technology, lifestyle, and community engagement. Uh, and really the image of the senior living has been typically that of nursing homes which are poorly managed. And it needs to change, and it is slowly beginning to change, to continuing care of active seniors. The problem I see right now is that there are very few evidence-based strategies to promote healthy aging that are being used in senior living. I think that's really a potential for research that can happen if there is partnership between um, senior living and university. Um, Actually, we have a paper coming out in Seniors Housing and Care Journal where we talk about this, how do we reimagine? So one thing is, you know, what is in a name? There is a lot in a name. This idea about retirement communities is actually in some ways pejorative. And we need to change that to intergenerational, continuing care communities. So there is active engagement with different generations. And this is important also. Testing evidence-based technology and preventive health care. If we do that, these things would be reimbursable by Medicare, Medical, or health insurance. But we need evidence base for that. And so this is research in real world where people live. Um, and the universities, some universities are already doing that, and we hope to do that at UCSD too, starting some certificate or diploma courses for staff in the senior living, and also public campaign to reduce stigma against aging. So we propose something that uh, Stavros and colleague had described more than a decade ago. This is called SOAR model. You know, when you think about strategic planning, people use what is called SWOT model. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But that is opportunities and threats. That's a negative connotation, right? So we call it, so this is what Stavros called SOAR model, strength, opportunities, aspirations, and results. Let's focus on what our aspirations are. What do we want to be like? How can we make a difference? And then, measurable outcomes. That's something that is missing in much of the other literature. So, the senior living that one can hope for the future would be multi-generational neighborhood, uh, new designs for existing spaces and new spaces, healthcare room. Uh, you know, just uh, right now we have kitchen, living room, and family room. There should be healthcare room, which are the health kiosk. I'll show that in the next slide. Uh, telemedicine through Skype, robotic helper, wearable and environmental sensors, um, other specific functional rooms, similar activities room, sleep room, nutrition room, and sensor technology to monitor falls, make emergency calls, and optimal lighting. So this is what a healthcare room may partly look like. So there is a health kiosk, you sit on it, and it measures your blood pressure, temperature, pulse. You also does your EKG, EEG, and the information is transmitted in real time to your physician or to the emergency room. And telemedicine, so you can do through Skype on your uh, TV right there. Um, and there's a robotic helper for medication management. And again, this is not some future science. It is going to happen soon, and we want to help make it happen in San Diego before it happens elsewhere. Uh, these are the robots uh, that uh, Dr. Laurel Reek uh, professor of engineering here has been working on, and she's going to be on one of the panels later in the afternoon. Really exciting futuristic work on robots for wellness, rehabilitation, mobility, uh, ho housework, and whatever. 
I talked about uh, innovative design. So there are a bunch of innovative design elements like special flooring to prevent falls, LED lighting, flexible rooms, which will allow the floor plan to be modified as the resident's needs or interests change. Smart home sensor technology to monitor for fault, malfunctioning appliances, make emergency calls. Use of machine learning and robotics to support residents in everyday tasks like vacuum cleaners or to engage them with exercises to enhance cognitive skills. Very important is intergenerational activities. And this is an example of a nursing home, nursing home, mind you, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's called Grace Living Center. It's a nursing home next to a kindergarten. And these older people, including many with dementia, in the, they get up early in the morning and they sit glued to the glass so they can see these young kids running. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then those kids work with these older people in terms of, so older people, they may read a story, they work on some art project. It's a win-win situation. The kids feel happy that they have a grandparent like person. The older people feel less lonely, more loved by younger people, right? Uh, so one thing we have been thinking about at UCSD is university affiliated intergenerational housing command, commun community, as Dr. Brenner says, kind of a living lab. Um, and actually one thing I would like all of everybody here in the audience to do is send us your thoughts and suggestions about this because this is in the very early stages of planning and we would welcome your suggestion. And then the, there are already some universities that have similar um, intergen similar housing communities, but we want UCSDs to be really unique in several ways. So the, this will be a place for testing innovative models of enhancing healthcare and well-being, involving technology as well as lifestyle intervention. The benefits will be number of programs that the university has, proximity to the campus, um, healthcare, you know, we have some of the best medical care here uh, with the Jacobs and uh, other medical centers here, and alumni base. So there are lots of customers who will be there uh, and mixed use facilities, which can be used both by older and younger people in the community. Wellness and fitness programs, entertainment, cultural activities, art and dance studio, cafes, library, gardening and potting room, yes, even beauty parlor uh, and on-site classes. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is all the perks of a college campus minus term papers and exams. So <laughs> that's the goal. And so I, right now we are thinking of if this will be a few years down the road, but it will be open not just for faculty, but actually for the public. As a matter of fact, we expect that two-thirds of the residents will be, com will be coming from the community. So, in conclusion, healthy aging will become a rallying cry. Senior housing will become a key player in ensuring older adults' health, well-being, and longevity. Partnerships between senior living and academic centers will enable the development and testing of new approaches to promote healthy aging. So, you know, people call something silver tsunami as if it's a disaster waiting to happen with people getting older and they imagine these frail, disabled, elderly people who are, are going to cost a lot to the society and become a burden to the younger generation. We totally, totally refute, uh, refute that idea. We believe that there should be a golden way of healthy, happy, active and wise seniors. Uh, that is not only feasible, but it is happening and we want it to happen everywhere, starting with San Diego. Let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Jesty. We have a few minutes uh, for Q&A, so we're gonna have some staff members walking around the room to grab the cards. We'll all get started. We've had a lot of questions come through about the Academic Senior Living Partnership, and I know this is a model that's ga gaining a lot of traction nationwide. What do you see are the, b are the benefits of an Academic Senior Living Partnership for an older adult? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think this has benefits for everybody. It has benefits for the academic center, it has benefit for the senior living, and it has benefit most importantly hey, for the people there. who live there. Uh, for the university and academic centers, this is real world research. You know, when you do research and people coming to the lab, that really doesn't reflect what the real world is. So the universities will benefit from that. For the senior living, right now, I believe the senior living spends a lot of money 
on sometimes technology and other things that are not really evidence based. And there is no clear idea that that thing really helps. For example, for brain health, there are a number of gadgets that some senior housing communities use. There is no evidence that they work. A recent report by the Institute of Medicine suggested that there is no evidence based strategy for improving cognition. So instead of wasting that money on something that is not working, why not do research on that? And so it will involve a small amount of uh, R&D budget, research and development budget, but do randomized controlled trials and look at the benefits, not only in terms of well-being, but in terms of health. And if we can show that that technology or lifestyle intervention reduces the healthcare costs, Medicare, Medical, private insurance will be delighted to um, reimburse that because everybody is worried about the increasing healthcare costs for older people and we can, so we have an opportunity to do that here. And for residents, of course, this is great because they want something that really will help them. So I think there is, this is something that can be helpful for uh, uh, all the constituents involved in that. Thank you. Uh, it seems that technology is starting to take a role in senior living. How do you see research in this area evolving in the senior living industry? Yeah, that, that's an, also an excellent question. So the technology is, go, right now, as I said, there is a gap between the supply and the demand. We don't have enough geriatric healthcare specialists compared to the need that is there. Technology is absolutely critical in bridging that gap. Technology will make it possible for healthcare to be delivered to a group of people rather than one-on-one -on -one from one physician and one patient through telemedicine. Similarly, another use would be through the sensors, biosensors, Fitbit, I think we all use that. Um, here at UCSD and Qualcomm Institute, really there's some very innovative research going on on developing new sensors that will measure your blood glucose that will measure your sodium, potassium. And if we have older people having that, we will be able to anticipate if somebody is going, becoming confused or likely to go into delirium or the risk of fall has increased. So we can prevent those things through this kind of technology. Uh, so, and last but not least, this technology will enable people to collect continuous data for many years in people. Right? I mean, if somebody were to use, let's say, Fitbit, and you have it, and you are using it 24-7 for a number of years, the data collected will be so helpful, because those are the big data, and they will help us deciding when somebody is going down. Um, somebody, for example, somebody who has a um, heart attack, subsequently, every time there is some chest pain, you worry, is it a heart attack, right? So instead of going to the emergency room, if you have the technology that is measuring your heart rate variability all the time, and as soon as it starts going down or increasing, you can catch it and you can do something. So it's really beneficial for everybody. What is the center doing to promote seniors' interaction with young children in regards to, say, the grandparent? So what we are doing is uh, we look at grandparents in a broad sense, not the biological grandparents only, but people who are in that age group, who are grandparent substitutes. I think it is really important because one of the big problems in old age is loneliness and feeling of not being wanted. Um, actually, I gave a talk um, about a month ago in Omaha and there was one person sitting in the audience and he said that I was born in 1927 so he's 90 years old. He said, I'm quite active. I st read and do a lot. He was a former professor. He said, nobody wants me. I can do so much for other people, including the younger ones. So, so really, there's a critical need that we are wasting resources there when they can be used for appropriate purposes and who can benefit more than the younger generation. So there are some intergenerational activity program that we are doing. One I mentioned it was related to the advocacy. Um, another is this um, developing technology uh, in partnership with them. Um, actually, San Diego's uh, local government, the area agency on aging, um, aging and independent services, has some great um, intergenerational program. 
And so this is something we want to work with. But what is lacking in many of the programs across the country? Lack of evidence. So we really need to do a systematic research showing that people who get intergenerational activities, both older and younger, do significantly better than the other. I'm, I'm convinced that they will. But we also need to look at the various outcome measures before and after, even including biomarkers of aging. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, Dr. Jesty. What steps will the center take to combat stigma against aging? Sorry? What steps will the center take to combat stigma against aging? Right. I think, th yeah, th th that's a million dollar question. And right now, AARP, Leading Age, and a bunch of other uh, institutions are very involved in how to reduce the stigma against aging. I think it needs to be a multi-pronged approach. But what is important is again these intergenerational activities and presenting the image of older people as those who are active, vibrant, wise, happy, rather than this usual notion about being disabled, frail, demented, etc. Uh, we did a study which was so we train medical students. We have a training grant from NIH. They come and spend three months of the summer to get them interested in aging. We found that this program, after three months, the significant improvement in the attitude of the students toward aging and older adults because they were exposed to successful agers. And so what we need to do is, and what we have been doing and we continue to do, is exposing the students and the younger generation to successful aging, positive aging side. Again, thank you all for your attention.